Hi, everybody, and welcome to the um, European Marine Board's third Thursday Science Webinar Series. Uh, my name is Sheila Haywans, and I am the Executive Director of the European Marine Board, and <clears throat> um, today I will be your moderator. So um, just a few housekeeping rules, first of all. Please make sure that your name is clearly entered um, so that when you ask a question, I can actually say who is asking the question. If you want to ask a question, please use the Q&A, which should be at the bottom of your screen. And it would be nice if you say what organization you're from, which country you're from, and um, then I can uh, pick questions from there and I will read the questions out at the end to the speakers. If you have any technical issues, please use the uh, chat function. And please be aware that the webinar is being recorded and um, hopefully live streamed on YouTube. And <clears throat> we will make it available on um, our website and on our YouTube channel. So with, uh, with that, uh, I thought I would let you know about the, um, uh, uh, the, the document that, we, that this webinar is linked to. It's linked to our Blue Carbon uh, Policy Brief. Um, on blue carbon, the challenges and opportunities to mitigate the climate and biodiversity crises. Um, and we will basically um, have two talks here. The first one will be about uh, by Natalie Hicks, uh, who was one of the co-authors of the document. Uh, she is a senior lecturer at the University of Essex. Um, and she was a co-author, as I said. And then our second talk will be from Thorsten Thieler, who is the founder of the Global Ocean Trust and the strategic advisor to the IUCN's Blue Natural Capital Financing Facility and a, a senior advisor to the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance. Um, and he will talk about the national contribution, determined contributions. Um, so without further ado, I will stop sharing my screen. And Natalie, if you can uh, share your screen and give your talk sharing that's what I want to do um then that would be great thank you perfect hopefully you can see that Sheila yes uh, it's not in full screen mode yet it should be coming through yeah. now perfect yeah there we go a little time lag brilliant thank you okay thank you Sheila for inviting me I'm really pleased to give a sort of brief 10 minute overview on our policy brief on blue carbon I would encourage you to read this uh, although it's based on our latest scientific understanding of blue carbon it's written in a really easy style to understand so you don't have to be an expert scientist researching blue carbon to understand the policy brief now, one of the first things that comes up when we talk about blue carbon is quantifying what blue carbon is, what is the definition of blue carbon. And traditionally, when this term was first coined, it was really focused on uh, vegetative coastal ecosystems, such as mangroves, salt marshes and seagrasses. And these are ecosystems with soft sediment, which have uh, rooted plants within the sediment. Uh, and so these were for a long time what people thought of when we talked about blue carbon. Recently, our understanding of uh, carbon in the marine system and where a lot of the carbon is stored has grown. And so this definition has also started to expand. And, and now we talk about blue carbon whilst also considering the soft sediments that surround not only these rooted vegetation, but also our offshore continental shelf. So uh, it includes marine sediments, whether they coastal shelf and offshore. And this is partly due to the vast amounts of carbon that these sediments contain. Often uh, that can be a little bit confusing if we talk about some of the other biological functions and, and species within the carbon cycle that really drive it. And I'll touch on this a bit later in one of my other slides. And we'll talk about things like deep ocean. There's a huge amount of carbon that's actually stored in the deeper depths of the ocean and water masses. Um, whales and fish stocks, we don't consider them blue carbon themselves, but they are really important for driving the biological carbon cycle. Uh, similarly with kelp and macroalgae, they do take up CO2 like many plant species, but they do not bury it. They tend to be found on the hard or rocky shorelines and they're lacking the soft sediment where a lot of the carbon from our, our coastal blue carbon ecosystems ends up. And we also don't consider calcifying organisms as part of blue carbon. So things like merle and shellfish, uh, partly because uh, the process of calcification as they create those hard structures also emits CO2. So for this policy brief, we really nailed the definition down to be the coastal vegetation habitat. So uh, salt marsh, seagrass and mangroves with this rooted vegetation, but also the marine sediments that are found in our coastal, continental and offshore sediments. And when we talk about uh, blue carbon, what's really important is not so much the carbon that's captured directly from the atmosphere, but the long term storage of that carbon. 
When we talk about blue carbon ecosystems, predominantly we talk about the benefits of using them for climate mitigation. And we're seeing them more and more as a nature-based solution uh, to climate change. But restoration and protection of these habitats comes with other additional co-benefits, such as helping to improve biodiversity. So we're able to tackle the climate and biodiversity crises at the same time. And this is partly through provision of habitat or food, particularly in some of the coastal habitats. But it also underpins a lot of livelihoods that live on the coast or on the ocean. It protects our coastlines from storms and floods. So if you think about soft sediment coastlines where perhaps you might find a salt marsh, as we see increased storms and floods due to climate change, uh, these soft sort of spongy habitats absorb a lot of the energy from the ocean and thus protect the coastline, as well as supporting a number of other societal needs such as food security. However, blue carbon is not going to solve climate change for us and there are a number of limitations as to why it could be completely effective. One of these is the geographical extent or the available space available to restore some of these salt marsh habitats, particularly the coastal ones. We only have a limit on the amount of coast and suitability of that coast for these vegetated habitats. And we know that based on estimates of uh, maximum restoration of previously existing coastlines or coastal blue carbon ecosystems, that even if we were to maximize their potential, they would still only account for about 2% of our current global emissions. And also at the same time that we're trying to restore and protect these habitats, uh, climate change is still continuing. And so this is going to eventually reduce the effectiveness of these blue carbon systems in taking up and storing carbon, partly through to things like loss of space, uh, warming, and also the increasing frequency and duration of drought, which affects the plant communities and the sediments within these habitats. So in order to maximize the potential of blue carbon and its ability to mitigate the climate, as well as its uh, co-benefits, it's really essential that we reduce our greenhouse gas emissions globally, but also to keep global warming as close to the 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial as per the Paris Agreement. Now, I touched on this on my first slide, talking about the role of the ocean in the carbon cycle. So the ocean plays a huge role in the global carbon cycle, moving carbon around, um, not just across the surface, but also at depth. And the ocean naturally takes up about a quarter of all our CO2 emissions uh, directly through diffusion and through biological processes, which capture it at the surface. However, the more and more CO2 it uptakes and the more greenhouse gas emissions that we emit, this uptake from the ocean will diminish over time. And in some cases, we may see release of the CO2 from the seawater back into the atmosphere. Much of the ocean, uh, much of the carbon within the ocean is moved by the biological carbon pump. And these are pretty much all the living organisms that live within the ocean, things like whales and fish, all the way down to zooplankton and phytoplankton. And they transport the organic carbon around the ocean, right from the very surface where it's captured in CO2 through photosynthesis and all the way down at depth. Everything that happens in the ocean, whether it's phytoplankton photosynthesizing or fish feeding, uh, will eventually end up on the seabed in a small proportion. And a very small proportion of this will become sequestered and stored in the sediment for hundreds of years. And this is the important thing for blue carbon, the sequestration and storage of that carbon on geological timescales. Blue carbon is a relatively new science, so there's still a lot of uncertainties about it. Some of it are the dynamics of the carbon itself, and some of it are on the effectiveness and its ability to mitigate for climate change. We know that the coastal area is limited, limited for restoration, so there's only a maximum amount of area that we can have for this. And this uh, lack of understanding in the scientific carbon flows and dynamics is really important and reflected in the carbon accounting. So at the moment, the carbon credit schemes do not uh, accurately adjust or show um, how we can account for carbon based on our scientific knowledge. And Torsten will touch a bit more on this in his coming talk. We've also not really considered the role of other greenhouse gases, and we know that methane and nitrous oxide are also emitted alongside CO2, uh, particularly in some of the restored coastal habitats, and this is something which a lot of research is focused on understanding now, and it's likely there's a timeline scale of that too, so comparing restored to established um, habitats is really important. And we don't, also don't really understand the role of human activity on uh, some of our carbon stores, such as the off-shelf or continental shelf sediments, so uh, things like trawling. Uh, so there'll have to be uh, decisions made on what we're using our seabed area for. Are we going to prioritise and use it as an MPA? Um, are we going to allow it there to be fisheries or is it going to be used for offshore wind development? So these are all trade-offs and priorities from a management perspective that will need to be considered moving forward. 
Towards the end of the policy brief, uh, we sort of summarise some of our key findings, um, the ma main key messages, and also issue some recommendations to policymakers and researchers. Uh, we're really keen that there's future funding for research to reduce some of these uncertainties around blue carbon, not only the amount of carbon that's removed and stored, but also the role of greenhouse gases in this uh, and what those impacts might be over the longer term. And also in terms of understanding the offshore carbon stocks, we've got really limited understanding on how those function and how those might change over time and what the possible impact of some human activities such as trawling and deep sea mining might have on these carbon stocks. It's also really important to not only go out and capture this information once, but do this over long term so we can uh, look at the observations and changes in the carbon stocks and fluxes and not just a time uh, sort of one single time shot. And this will allow us to improve our ocean carbon budget, but also understand some of the roles of the biological carbon pumps and the sedimentary carbon storage and how they link together. And improving our understanding of the carbon dynamics will allow us to better parameterize process models. So for example, we could model the impact of certain human activities on some of these carbon stores through our understanding of things like carbon remineralization. And that makes it a really strong tool for management decisions. But most importantly for blue carbon to be effective and an effective solution for climate mitigation and the other co-benefits, it's important we have a sort of multidisciplinary approach. So this is not a role for environmental scientists, it's a role for all sorts of disciplines, including social scientists, ecological uh, uh, economists, uh, engineers, policy makers. And I think to really ensure that the integration of blue carbon solutions for climate mitigation, this multidisciplinary approach must be used. If you'd like to read this yourself, you can download a copy of the policy brief directly from the European Marine Board website, and I'm sure they'll send out a link after this. Um, you can also scan the QR code if you'd like to download this yourself. Um, and I will stop now, and I'm really happy to take any questions after Torsten's talk. Yeah, thank you very much, Natalie. Wonderful. Um, and I will just let uh, Torsten take over now. And remind everybody that you can put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. So, Torsten, if you want to share, that would be great. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Natalie, for, for that really helpful summary and introduction. Having the uh, EMB report is really helpful to put the scientific basis out to people so that they fully understand what the context is of, of uh, what we are discussing here. And uh, what my talk, given that I come from a finance and economics background, is going to do is to link this blue carbon scientific discussion to the policy discussion, which we call under the Paris Agreement, the nationally determined contributions. And then in turn, think about it as a financing of blue natural capital as a nature-based solution. So the goal is obviously very much to help protect and where necessary restore these blue carbon ecosystems. In order to do so, we need funding. In order for finance to be delivered, we need to understand the economics of these uh, ecosystems. This is what we call blue natural capital. And we need to think about financial flows. And of course, carbon markets have been something developing over the last uh, number of years. And where the blue carbon ecosystems sit in these markets is really important. So what is blue in this context? Uh, we already learned about the blue carbon ecosystems themselves. What markets are all about is really the question whether you can quantify tons of carbon that are sequestered and whether you can sell on the back of the sequestration that additional sequestration effort. So sequestration that comes from activities can then be put into the market. People can invest into that, buy these as credits. Now, in the policy context, we refer to these blue NDCs. The Paris Agreement is based on a bottom-up approach. Every country is supposed to outline what its contribution will be to achieve the overall outcome of the Paris Agreement, the 1.5 degrees. These nationally determined contributions 
contain a whole range of measures that countries commit themselves to. And increasingly, countries include blue carbon um, protection efforts, conservation efforts, investment efforts in this, uh, in their definition of what they are uh, committing themselves to do under the Paris Agreement. Now, the concept of blue natural capital is very much the idea that just like we have human capital and manufactured capital and knowledge capital, nature, of course, is a key, key, actually the basis of our entire economy. And so that is increasingly being valued in national accounts in the way we think about trade-offs. And so blue just takes these carbon ecosystems that Natalie described and thinks about them as such an asset, as something that we can put an economic value on so that we can make decisions about protecting and conserving them. And then blue finance is really the narrative of how we deliver the money necessary to make these protection measures. How can we identify in particular nature-based solutions and their multitudes of benefits that Natalie mentioned, the co-benefits relative to a technical solution that may address only one aspect, may address mitigation, but not adaptation, may address mitigation, but not biodiversity. And all of this sits into a broader discussion we have on the policy side about how we can grow our sustainable blue economy and a just transition, i.e. a transition of countries and economies all around the world in uh, local spaces and globally that address clim climate, biodiversity and risk issues and increases resilience for everybody. So carbon markets, as I described, is this one credit equal to one ton of avoided reduced or removed um, emissions and is a concept that has been going on for quite some time. And so the interesting discussion really is here, where are we at in the carbon markets and where are these carbon markets going so that we optimize the flow of funding into nature and protection while giving these just benefits on the ground and while making sure that this is all scientifically sound. And we have really two types of markets. We have so-called compliance markets that are set under international regulation and voluntary markets that are based on, for instance, the demand by corporates and others as part of their net zero commitments to buy credits and the supply from individual projects, project developers and their partners. And these two markets have developed in parallel and to some degree, the voluntary market has had much more experimentation, if that is the right term, projects, approaches tried out, independent verification processes tried out. Um, and it's fair to say there have been challenges. There are costs around development and verification. There's limited financing option for developers in that early stage of a project. But we have a lot of experience and lessons now that we can use to improve the compliance world as well. And in particular, to focus on how to get it right in the blue carbon space. The compliance world, we are still not at the point where all of the Paris Agreement provisions, and particularly Article 6.2 and 6.4, are fully implemented. And that is where the core of these NDCs comes in, because the idea was very much, is very much in the Paris Agreement, that countries that then outperform, that deliver additional credits, can use this in transactions with other places, with other countries. And that would help deliver the full range of financial flows, because, again, Back to the commercial reality, we want money to flow in particular into developing countries that have blue carbon ecosystems, don't have the necessary resources to fully develop, protect uh, and, and restore them. And that's what the point of this whole effort is. 
So blue carbon, obviously, very specifically for, for these areas. And we have a whole range of recent um, new publications from the World Bank, for instance, about uh, how to unlock blue carbon development. We have from a broader range of participants, uh, high quality blue carbon principles and guidance. We still have a relatively small market and we still have a relatively low price. When I say relative, is this is the price of a ton bought through a credit compared to what we would call as an economist, the social cost of carbon, i.e. the benefit for humanity of that ton of carbon being taken out of the system. So the goal is very much to develop these standards further so that we have sufficient financing, price points that are adequate, and the real important environmental ecological outcome on the ground. Now, the great breakthrough on the finance side is things like the Mangrove Breakthrough Financial Roadmap, which really shows how an amount of, say, US dollar 4 billion could flow into this area in the coming years to actually deliver this at the right scale. So it's an exciting space. It's still a growing space. And a lot of the debate is how we make the blue carbon space kind of the, the high point of where this broader carbon market sits. Learn from the lessons, make it better precise for the blue space on the basis of common standards and methodologies. Now, as I mentioned, we have these NDCs and more and more countries have now written in um, very specific um, blue contributions, which could be things like, I will protect a certain number of hectares, or I will invest in a certain space. The challenge of some of these um, policy statements is obviously, A, they are just political commitments, important political commitments, but also B, it's very difficult to add them all up. How do you have a single accounting mechanism? And that is where some of the discussion lies right now. And then the point I already made on the social cost of carbon. So, how do we quantify the overall impact? We now have a number of discussion papers, analysis for certain regions, how this can be done. And um, as countries update their nationally determined contributions, we uh, see an increasing understanding, sophistication of how to integrate these, these uh, blue carbon ecosystems in the NDCs and this effort to quantify, which, as I outlined, is crucial if we want to get to that next phase in um, terms of compliance markets under Article 6.2 and 4. So blue finance, we're stepping back from the specifics of trading and policy to the broader narrative of how do we achieve sustainable financing for a sustainable blue economy. And obviously, this is particularly important to companies and coastal areas that are already very much exposed to the ocean. So if you live near a mangrove area and the mangrove protects you from storm surges, this really matters to you. But actually, frankly, it affects a much broader group of, of companies and people because the health of the ocean is very much at the core of the health of the planet, value chains of product depend on functioning nature-based solutions. And finally, the financial sector is increasingly exposed to very clear taxonomies from regulators that make the financial sector look at carbon impacts of their investments, etc. So um, this is a really important area because it determines this overall understanding and engagement that is necessary that all actors engage in these solutions. And whilst Natalie explained rightly, it's a smaller part of the total, it's one of the most attractive parts of the total because per investment, per hectare, blue carbon delivers multiple benefits. And um, in fact, we uh, recently published a paper through the Ocean Panel that outlined ocean solutions to climate change in the broader context. And the conclusion of the experts there was that 35% of the climate challenge 
could be addressed through ocean and ocean-related activities. So understanding that, seizing this opportunity, understanding the impacts is absolutely crucial. Now, as I mentioned, blue natural capital is, is, is an economic term. It's about valuing these uh, systems. And if you want to read more about it, and in particular about blue carbon credits, I'd recommend this paper we published uh, last year, uh, the, the Blue Carbon Handbook, which outlines both the specifics of how these markets can be financed. Because again, finance needs to come first. We need pre-market commitments. We need engagement so that these projects can be developed so that then the projects deliver credits in, into the market. Uh, the Blue National Capital Financing Facility is an example of a grant-making facility set up through IUC and that supports individual projects that are on the path to be potentially um, commercially investable. So the blue economy in that broader concept is really a way of looking at all the sectors that are key for this area, that are part of the sustainable blue space, how we can focus financing and financing flows, both in terms of direct investment, which is often from an equity point of view through impact funds, who then can, for instance, invest into local companies or local projects that would actually run, uh, uh, for instance, a, a blue carbon project. Um, but also the broader financing structure for what I call blue infrastructure, which is particularly about how the development finance institutions, the big multilaterals and uh, bilateral development finance institutions can support this transition and use these nature-based solutions like blue carbon in order to make whole coastscapes and seascapes better. And there is now a new working group around that. And so the focus is on this regenerative blue economy that integrates such nature-based solutions. And when we use the term insetting, we just mean integrate your blue carbon project into the broader financing project. Or to take a very simple example, when you extend it, when the port of Rotterdam was extended, the wetlands area around it was part of the investment because these wetlands provide such crucial nature-based solution services. So, Final slide on the broader Article 6.2 context. So this national scale thinking, this refers to something called RED Plus and the sovereign carbon credits. And we've just had the first transaction under what is referred to as internationally transferable mitigation outcomes, ITMOS. So it's a way, in this case, for the city of Bangkok to have a transaction with a country of Switzerland, but it's really, can we use these mechanisms to bring money from some countries into the countries that are at the forefront of blue carbon ecosystems? So suggestions to be made is we need to continue to work on having a structured, regulated, and highly liquid market of high quality blue carbon so that there are safeguards on the buyers, the prices are uh, commensurate with this value, i.e. the social cost of carbon. And that will require market bodies, registries, that will require rules about how the revenues from initial credit issuance actually go back to local, local opportunities, communities, and, and, and projects. And it needs to make sure that the national rules and regulations are fully integrated into the NDCs because we want to avoid double counting. And we can only have international transactions if on the national basis, we already are achieving the goals. And so this is a clear pathway aligned with 1.5 degrees. And this is all part of what we generally call sustainable conservation finance, because we are financing nature-based solutions for the blue economy and for conservation. And there's a whole range of financial tools. All these can be applied to, brought to bear in order to make this whole area grow further. And so we see the 
Um, ocean investment thesis is one of the most important investment theses as we go forward for a much broader range of, of, of partners and investors than those who looked at this traditionally. And one of the recent analysis is this one from the International Finance Corporation, Deep Blue Opportunities for Blue Carbon Finance and Coastal Ecosystems. This has lots of practical applications because countries, and a lot of them have already signed up to what they call 100% sustainable ocean plans. So how do you look at your entirety of your oceans and coastal sphere and think about how it is financeable, both in terms of conservation, but also in terms of NDCs, in terms of these uh, business models for blue carbon, and how does it fit with these frameworks and standards that are uh, developing and are becoming increasingly relevant for, for international um, actors. So one of the formats in which we try to bring investment here into coastal livelihoods and blue natural capital is the sea change impact finance facility, which is an ecosystem set up under the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance to help promote, assist, and engage partners around these flows. So looking forward, this is important that a lot of further work takes place. We have some policy frameworks there already, but the opportunity is significant. And so this engagement, both from a science point of view, but also from a policy point of view, and from an economic and financial point of view, has to come together. It's exactly what Natalie ended her presentation with this multi-stakeholder approach, this is one of these really important goals and opportunities. And I will provide the slides so there's a lot of background reading if you're interested. Thank you so much and I look forward to the questions. Thank you very much, Torsten. Wonderful. Um, okay. Oh, I've not put my, my video on. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much uh, for that. And nice that you're back uh, also, Natalie. <laughs> so uh, I see we have some questions in the Q&A. And for Torsten to have a moment of, whew, I will <laughs> ask the first one to Natalie. Um, Natalie, I see Annelies Budema uh, asked, um, she's from the IMDC, Marine and Dredging Consultancy Company in Belgium. Uh, can you tell us more about ongoing developments to monitor carbon capture in coastal ecosystems? Okay, I'm going to assume she means that biological natural capital through plants. Uh, yeah. yeah, there's a yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll go with that. Annalise can jump in if that's not what she means. Um, yeah, there's a number of different research programs and projects going on at the moment to ascertain this, and and we're looking at the carbon on different levels. So if you think about the coastal vegetated habitats, you've got the biomass, which is the above ground biomass, which is in the plant, that's carbon initially, um, and we've got what's in the sediments around that, so the total amount of carbon too. Um, but we're increasingly we're trying to understand the role of greenhouse gases in this. So there's a lot of research going on and understanding how uh, CO2, uh, methane, and nitrous oxide changes across those habitats and then you've got layers of complexity within that so you've got established coast, uh, coastal habitats that have been there for a while so maybe a salt marsh or a seagrass system that's been there for a number of years that we know but we've also got the restored ones and we know that by geochemically they're really different uh, and so we're trying to apply the same measures across the board for all of those to try and tease out uh, where some of that detail might be. And we suspect, for example, salt marshes, the newer restored ones will tend to emit more greenhouse gases like methane initially uh, than they take up carbon. So understanding that timeline and how that might change and what influences that is really important. So it's a really active area and there's a lot of research being done on that. Yeah. So I, I will follow on with that because I see she's from the Marine and Dredging consultants, uh, Consultancy. Mm -hmm. So maybe also talk about monitoring of carbon capture in offshore i mean i know you've done some work on that yeah um that's more difficult obviously uh once you go offshore out of the photic zone you don't have a plant input as much um unless it comes down from the surface waters and again uh understanding the impact of activities like dredging on those carbon stocks is very much a bit of a gap at the moment um and that's some that's an active area of research too we're trying to work out if that is a problem but coming back 
Well, that's quite interesting. So in the UK, we often look at the benef beneficial use of those dredged materials. So can we use those for something good? Um, and at the moment, there's a project going on where they're using dredged materials from Harwich Haven Authority, so in one of the estuaries, and using that to build back up um, some of the salt marshes. So it's taking that sediment, putting it somewhere else to try and restore salt marsh to what it it's kind of uh, possibly what would be seen as a negative impact with a potential positive outcome in the long term. Yeah, great. Um, and uh, and maybe I can follow on uh, for you, Torsten, on that question, um, because uh, Natalie was talking there about the fact that, you know, restoring these these systems sometimes Sometimes in the beginning, they actually there's a lag between whether they're becoming carbon capture and they actually have some negative impact in the beginning. Is that something that can be taken into account in finance, or is it kind of when you finance it, you finance it for for a you're going to create something and and you you do you, I mean so do they look at whether what they're financing is actually going to do what it says on the tin? <laughs> <laughs> that very much so, but. Uh, you have to remember it's in the end the credit which is a regulated product mm -hmm. that determines what your return is so whether or not the implications for the carbon calculation yeah. are affected is yeah. in a way the the key in terms of what the financial return would be from the credit. Mm -hmm. But let me break this down a bit further. So if all you think about is the credit and the return and then the regulated part of that, you are missing out a lot of what happens beforehand. Mm -hmm. And that's why Natalie's points are so important and would be really important to me as a financier. Because from a financing point of view, I finance the project. I think about the project and the return is something that happens at the end of the project. Mm -hmm. So I want to understand whether the project is robust and what are the implications during the period of the project. So as a financier of the project, and this could be a development finance institution that, for instance, lends money to the Philippines in order for the Philippines to help restore coastal habitats, including mangroves, that institution will say, well, what is the best available science? What happens around these various greenhouse gases? What are the time frames that we need to take into account till we get to that desired outcome, which is a, a, a restoration effort that gives us solid credits of carbon in the future. And so the financing consideration, to my mind, is very much taking science into account and this variety of, of analysis. And we have a whole range of science-based targets now, the Science-Based Targets Initiative. It's, it's a very key point. If I mentioned the Sustainable Blue Economy Finance Principles, where, again, we put the science alignment as one of the found Mm -hmm. of the financing. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really important to separate that financial analysis and that understanding of how we support these projects with the understanding that in the end, the return, so to speak, or the way the funds could flow back comes from the sale of a credit. Mm -hmm. And so my argument is very much that at the moment, the market's in tend to discount this kind of quality that we're working towards. Mm -hmm. And so for me, a quality blue carbon credit to differentiate it from a standard carbon credit <laughs> to, to be said, is one where all of these things have been assessed properly. And we really can in the long term say, this is delivering what it says on the tin. Mm -hmm. And therefore I'm willing to pay not $10 or $20, but $100 or $200. Yeah. Okay. And so in the end, doing that hard work at the beginning pays back if that mm -hmm. is where we can get to. And so it's really trying to follow through that whole whole process yeah. and figure out how we can get to that, that outcome that we yeah. need, which is in the end, the outcome on the ground. It's the yeah. outcome in the system. Yeah. 
And um, I think Natalie had a question about taking scientific uncertainties into account. And that was also one I'd written down. How do you take the uncertainties in the, because there are wide uncertainties in, in the kind of estimations of what this, what it can really provide. So how is that taken into account? Is that part of this system that you're talking about? So let's separate two different types of uncertainty. We described one already, you know, that is for me a scientific uncertainty about what happens with gases, what happens with permanence in the system. So a lot of scientific topics mm -hmm. that are really exciting to understand and they're very much on the side of the science side. So we have to take them account from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. But then there are other uncertainties, which I think finance is very well qualified to take on board and does not need the scientists to give me the answers. So as a, for instance, if you say to me, your seagrass bed is now under these measures protected appropriately so that the sediment stock will remain. And we have stopped any types of activities that potentially put that living seagrass at risk and therefore the sediment is safe. I don't need as a finance person to tell me to have the scientist give me precise numbers on every single bit of what that sediment is because i can live with that uncertainty because i invest in that seagrass bed and for the next 25 years let's say that sediment carbon stock is mine and if i want to commercialize it further then yes i may have to have a transaction with a buyer mm -hmm. but it's a bit like buying or selling something else. We don't, we need to decide whether the buyer or the seller delivers the relevant data. Mm -hmm. But finance is good in terms of making decisions about uncertainty and risk because prices in the real markets change all the time. Yeah. And so things like the quantity can change here as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's really all about understanding what are scientific type of uncertainties mm -hmm. that we need science input for and what are quantity types of uncertainties if i call that or price mm -hmm. point uncertainties which finance very good to deal with mm -hmm. okay um and then the next question is by Jorge Sarik. sorry if i completely ruined your name there um, and the question is, is there a review of the methodologies and tools that are used to calculate blue carbon for specific habitats? I'm assuming that's for you, Natalie. Um, yes, there are a few. Um, a good one to look at is probably the Blue Initiative, Blue Carbon Initiative. They have a manual uh, which details how to collect samples and what sort of things to look for. Um, it's very coastal focused. So if you're interested in any of the coastal ecosystems, then that's a good place to look. Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, Anton Kuch asks, uh, what are your thoughts on establishing protected areas based on assessment of organic carbon stocks within sediment? Um, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of discussion around marine protected areas, and they are obviously set up often for biodiversity or key species. Uh, not necessarily for carbon. There is a thought that protecting parts of the sediment for carbon could be good by excluding activities. However, that is a little controversial and under underpins our lack of understanding on the carbon dynamics. So normally, for example, trawling would be seen as a destructive activity. Um, but from a carbon perspective, it's removing the animals that live in the sediment, which move that carbon about and it gets remineralized. So not having them promotes conditions where carbon is stored a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not fully understood. Obviously, you get other processes in the background. But yes, you would have to sometimes, for example, biodiversity, protect biodiversity and wanting to sequester carbon don't run together. They can mm -hmm. contradict each other. So understanding what your trade offs might be is a, is a key thing to consider for that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also in this context, if you look at it, not so much from a science, but from a regulatory point of view, if something is permanently protected through marine protected area, it's not necessarily part of the methodology for carbon credits because the methodology for carbon credits really deals about threats. So mm -hmm. um, there is some really interesting and, and challenging discussions around whether the introduction of an MPA to protect against uh, the type of destructive practices 
uh, say bottom trawling or whatever, would uh, be seen as a one-off measure that would deliver this kind of additionality. So it's a it's a good question and it's a complex question. So, so Torsten, are you saying that? Um, MPAs, creating an MPA by definition cannot then be seen as a carbon credit? Is that what I understand? No, what I'm saying is if I have an MPA yeah. and then identify inside the MPA some blue carbon, then that blue carbon is protected through the MPA already and I can't then go out and sell those credits. Okay, yeah, uh, precisely. So that's actually quite an interesting point. Um, then a question from Shingu Lee saying, "How do you uh, how do you think about some standards uh, to quantify blue carbon in some quant countries? Uh, are there different standards in different countries? I think, and and that will that hamper international uh, collaboration on the blue carbon market? I guess that's a question for both of you in a sense." Um, Starting with the standards from a scientific point of view, I'm assuming there's a scientific standard and, and it's not really different from country to country. Yeah, each country is, is working sort of independently but collaboratively to develop specific ones for their country. So within the UK, under the UK Blue Carbon Forum, there's different working groups for different habitats and coming up with different methodologies to do that. Um, the Blue Carbon Initiative manual is a good place to look at to start that. The greenhouse gases are a lot harder to measure, so that's that's more of a work in progress. And then I guess the, the second part of the question, will this hamper the, the collaboration in the market? So on the market side, you can, of course, define your market at any scale. And so, as a for instance, Japan has in a regional setting already gone further in terms of what they consider is a tradable market uh, around macroalgae, which in other countries doesn't exist. Korea has looked at tidal flats, where elsewhere this is still an open debate, etc. So, in fact, I, I would argue, yes, there are situations where you have these differences, but as long as it's done properly in a regulatory way, that is not a problem. That is uh, allows for an investment inside a specific regulatory space. Um, of course, we don't want the scientists to contradict each other around <laughs> what is a mangrove and how does it work. So, so I think we want global common understanding of the science, but the point where a regulator may go ahead and say, look, we now have sufficient information in order to create a type of market around it, that point may be different at, at different stages. And I think that that's actually a, a good thing because it also allows for some experimentation and experience. And a follow on question from that to you, Torsten, if I'm thinking of markets for, uh, I don't know, uh, people to do manual labor, you know, it, it, the 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 minimum wage in Belgium is very different from the minimum wage in South Africa, for instance. So there's this kind of um, differences in where people cr make stuff, right? So do you think there would be some similar similarities if the if a blue carbon credit is cheaper in Southern Africa, they would rather invest there than invest in Europe? Could you see that? Would that be a thing? So. Obviously, in the broader carbon markets, that's happening already. If all I want to buy is a ton of carbon, I tend to go to wherever I find the, the cheap ton of carbon. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the great opportunities we have with the blue carbon space is that by defining these higher quality standards, we go beyond looking at it as a quantity and look at it as a quantity with certain standards attached. Mm -hmm. So I would say, for instance, that a blue carbon credit that doesn't take the local community into account, that doesn't make sure that you have proper living standards, etc., would not even qualify as a blue carbon credit. And mm -hmm. so defining these social, environmental governance issues as part of the product is really key. And that, A, creates a higher price, but it also creates much more sleeping well at night for the buyer because yeah. the last thing a corporate 
wants is having bought a credit to deal with one environmental problem, i.e. climate mitigation, only to be called up the next day and have its reputation uh, called to question because it uses um, processes that are not acceptable un yeah. under standards. And I think this is back to sort of the core point that since we have the NDCs, probably 15 billion plus has of finance has come into developing countries to look after these ecosystems, to in, invest and protect and hire people to do so, etc. And that, that's the whole sort of rationale there mm -hmm. so that we get a positive outcome for nature and a positive outcome for people. Yeah, very good. Uh, and then another question from Anton about macroalgae. So, um, are there ongoing discussions about how microalgae could be integrated into blue carbon markets? You know, the feasibility, the carbon export, the burial. I think you mentioned Japan was doing that anyway with kelp. Macro yeah, I'll, I'll let Natalie go, go second on that because I think it's a really interesting discussion between the science debate around permanence. And I think Natalie outlined that very clearly. Yeah. And what is financially doable? So... For me, from a finance point of view, I can very easily imagine a carbon product based, okay. a financial carbon product based on macroalgae, provided that it has the right parameters. So as long as the algae is alive, it has X amount of carbon in there. Mm -hmm. It's not about permanence. It's for the years it's there, it's delivering something. Mm -hmm. So it's, and, and I mean, in a weird way, that is much closer to how terrestrial carbon works, because generally speaking, if we look at a tree that grows, that's the carbon we think about. It's not the long term sequestration mm -hmm. in the blue world. We are lucky <laughs> that we have more long term sequestration than you have in the terrestrial world. So for me, macroalgae are closer or kelp closer to the terrestrial world. Mm -hmm. And we could create a financial product, but it needs to be based on that proper scientific analysis and, and we can't sort of sell it as something that it's not. Mm. And maybe you want to come in on that again, Natalie. Yeah, that is one of the big controversies on blue carbon, why kelp and macroalgae are not really included in the blue carbon definition. And it is what Torsten said, that permanence. So they are really important for taking up carbon um, through their growing cycle. And at the end of the season, most of them are washed away and where it ends up and how much of it ends up sequestered, we don't really understand. There's a couple of studies done at trying to track that. Um, I do think it's something we're going to have better a better handle on in the coming years or so once that research comes through and is published. Uh, and we might be able to say uh, broadly, uh, this is a kelp forest and we know about 30% or something or 10% of it ends up being sequestered. And then you could add that permanence value to that. But mm -hmm. until we have that sort of scientific evidence, we, we're not including it in the blue carbon definition. And I mean, from what I know about these ecosystems, I think what happens off the west coast of Scotland is not going to be the same as what happens off France. It's yeah, not going exactly. to be the same as what happens in Namibia. So essentially, you're going to have to be able to prove that it's actually sequestered at the source that you're selling it, I would say. Yeah, Otherwise, and it's not a one-off, it's, co it's consistent. So that is the difficulty. Yeah. Um, and then we have one last question uh, for uh, Torsten from an anonymous attendee who said, could you please comment on how the European Union might include blue carbon in its national contributing determined contributions um, as indices are reported from the EU as a whole, as opposed to by each country? That's a difficult one. <laughs> I, I like that question because it's a really interesting way of thinking about how the EU deals with coastal protection and, and investment in these spaces. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we've done in the EU is think about sea basins, for instance. So we have a lot of initiatives around sea basins. So I would, for instance, say the EU could think about the Mediterranean sea basin and look at what um, a, a proactive strategy of seagrass conservation and restoration would be delivering in terms of carbon sequestration. And that could be in the NDCs. And um, the fact that you can aggregate from a European perspective doesn't change the fact that we still know how much uh, seagrass beds France has or Spain, etc. So, so each of these countries can look at what they already are doing in terms of 
protection restoration around blue carbon ecosystem. We could do the same further north around salt marshes. I come from the coast, just like the picture behind <laughs> you. <laughs> It'd be very interesting if we had numbers around that. And frankly, I think just putting it out there, even if the actual number is relatively speaking small, is really helpful for this debate. Because mm -hmm. then you become part of a system, you can deliver the science, you can really focus mm -hmm. on these. And you can think about then how, if you feel you want more blue carbon credits and you cannot deliver them inside the EU, how you engage in these regulated markets with other countries, with developing countries that may have a surplus of blue carbon, and you can come up with a transaction. Mm -hmm. um, Indonesia has vast range of, of blue carbon and so the engagement between say the EU and Indonesia around an, a common market <laughs> a common blue carbon approach is, is something definitely worth considering and, and the European NDCs and the ambition around NDCs is, is uh, again a really important part and so anything that brings this more into the limelight and shows that we're using these methodologies and scientific approaches is is, is all good news. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last question, I see that we're on the end of our time, but actually one of the things, and this is maybe my brain is working in ways, different ways, but um, in the EU, um, protection of your coastline is basically not managed at an EU level. You know, it's managed at a European at a at a country level, at a nation level level. So how does the EU plan? And it's not a question for you, it's maybe a question for the EU people out there listening. How do they plan to actually make sure that these NDCs are protected if they don't if they don't have a, a directive that says you have to protect these these things? If you see what I mean. Like I, I think that there's sort of two different strands, and then maybe Natalie also. Um, one is NDC is nationally, so it shows how is your pathway as a country going to go to get to the Paris Agreement? How does it all add up? Yeah. That's one mechanism. But then there's the reality of what can you do on the ground? And just pick one example, Andalusia has created a a, a, a carbon market type approach mm -hmm. just for Andalusia. And that is perfectly a feasible, but also yeah. relevant, <laughs> because that is exactly the type of experimentation at local and regional mm -hmm. level that can help us understand how this could work, how we can get financial flows into actual projects, etc. Mm -hmm. And indeed, I mean, it, uh, you you kind of have to do it at a as, at a sea basin scale because these there are impacts from the one to the other. So, yeah. Uh, Natalie, some last words from you, maybe. No, just to add on from what Torsten was saying, I think having that national level is really important. But at the end of the day, many of these systems are very site specific. And so a restoration measure that works in one may not work on the other. So being having something that captures that variability and that scale is really important. Mm -hmm. And I see this from somebody in, in the uh, Paula, I think, in, in the Secretariat, there's a question that I am going to go for um, to, to Torsten. Uh, is there already some sort of certification or labeling for genuine blue finance opportunities, um, uh, which are scientifically based and, you know, that could be developed so that we could make sure that it doesn't get greenwashed? Um, I, I refer to these high quality principles, mm -hmm. and that's really, I think, the pathway where, where we are going. And I think the interesting area to watch is will this end up just in a voluntary market or can we get a regulated blue market and how will that work out? So mm -hmm. watch the space. There's a lot developing and uh, some really high, high, in, high quality product coming out. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you, um, both of you. That was great. And hopefully I'm sharing my screen now so that I can just go to my very last slide. Uh, to say that uh, our next third Thursday science webinar will be on Thursday, the 21st of March, and it will be with uh, Peter Tayak from uh, the University of St. Andrews and from Woods Hole, who will be talking about ocean sound as an essential ocean variable for the global observing system.
Um, and so I hope to see you there. And just thank you very much to Torsten and Natalie for, for the talks. Uh, it was really fascinating and I, I'm sure we can talk more and we will talk more, Torsten, I'm sure, uh, about these things in the in the near future. So thank you very much, everyone.